Relax, man. I mean, how silly is that? Pulls off three-pointer. Bang! Bang! It's good! Wins the game at the buzzer! Yo, 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 yo. Welcome back to the Who Junkie Podcast, the number one sports podcast in the world. According to us. I'm your host, Zach, and I'm joined, as always, by the Memphis Grizzly man fan himself that just acquired a new player man himself, Chance Baker. How you doing, Chance? I'm doing great, man. Last night was the first night I can remember where I fell asleep before 11 o'clock. I'd had a men's league game. I'd been feeling a little under the weather, and I was like, I'm just going to crash early. And I literally think I fell asleep like five minutes before the trade hit because I was like, okay, like we had the original one that fell apart. They had that 11 o'clock central deadline, and I just barely missed it. And then I wake up to a text from my guy, Zach, that's like, oh, this Marcus Smart, that's a huge move for the Grizzlies. And I was like, wait, what did I miss? So I'm so upset that I fell asleep early the one night the Grizzlies are active. But yeah, I'm, I'm pumped, man. We'll get into it. But I think it's a well, great move. Well, and then uh, some more news that just kind of just, man, news is flying all day. So guys, look, we're on our lunch break right now um, in the middle of work. And we done peeled away just to uh, kind of give you guys a quick update on things. But Shams just tweeted, um, you know, we saw reports that Brandon Miller was looking like the guy at number two, but um, now uh, Scoot is gaining serious momentum. Literally um, just came through as we started recording yeah. this. So, I that. so that's going to be interesting because we know who's going number one, and then uh, depending on who goes two, I really think that Portland's going to have some options on on what on what they do next. Um, but. I mean, maybe uh, after uh, uh, Charlotte heard uh, Brandon Miller say that Paul George was his GOAT, they probably started questioning his judgment. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, all right, writing him off. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. We joke about that, but I did. I, I don't know if it was the Bill Simmons pod. I think it was his or one of the others that mentioned that there was some talk about Brandon Miller's interviews weren't going extremely well with some of the teams, whereas Scoot is a guy that like – He's just one of those guys you feel like is not going to be a bust. Like he has that work ethic. He's, you know, mm-hmm. generally all around good dude. And so if it were me, I would take Scoot. Obviously, you've got the Scoot LaMelo fit, which might be a little awkward, but I'm of the opinion of now basketball is getting so positionless. It doesn't hurt to have multiple ball handlers on the court. I would yep. go with Scoot and I would roll with it. If it doesn't work out, you can always work something out later, but why not try it out? You see so much more often nowadays where there are multiple ball handlers on the court. And I, I feel like you can make it work with guys as talented as Scoot and LaMelo. So I, well, that's what and, I would do if I were them. And, and we can't forget about the whole situation in Alabama. I'm not going to go all the way deep into it, but I feel Brandon like a lot Mil- of people did forget about yeah. this, which is weird. Yeah. Brandon Miller was not clean all the way in that situation, you know? And so um, obviously, you know, he's a, he's a star prospect, undeniably talented. Um, However, um, you know, we've seen this time and time again, where, where, you know, these top prospects where like, you see all this stuff that like even John Morant has been going through this, um, this off season, the stuff with like with Zion, where like sometimes, man, sometimes these guys judgment calls can affect, um, their ability to play and be on the court, right? And so, like, if you're an NBA franchise, you've got to weigh all of these risks um, and things uh, when you're when you're literally about to invest millions of dollars um, into to these athletes. Yep, absolutely. So, so, anyways, chance. Last night, I'm blowing you up, and dude, you're probably drooling out the side of your <laughs> mouth. And I don't know if you're drooling because you're asleep or you're drooling because you're salivating over this deal. So, Chance. A little bit of both. The first report of this deal was a three-way deal between the 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 Clippers, the Wizards, and the Boston Celtics, where it had Porzingis going to Boston. But then apparently uh, the Clippers were set up to trade Marcus Morris in the deal and get Malcolm Brogdon back in this three-team deal. But they did not like his health records. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very interesting decision on the Clippers to back out of this deal over health records because they went and, and pulled in Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Maybe the Clippers are finally learning their lesson yep. on listening to the medical staff. But the Clippers opted out last minute. Before we get into this deal, from the Clippers' perspective, do you think that this was the right thing to pull out of the deal? 
Um, I think so. I think when you learn, I mean, obviously we don't have access to, you know, the medical records and the evaluation that they got on Brogdon, but obviously that's the biggest issue with this team is Kawhi and Paul George are never healthy at the same time. And yeah, when you're adding another guy who has significant injury history, who is great when he's on the court, but again, like this guy's just never mm-hmm. available for a full season when you need him. And so just adding that to the mix of an already questionable injury history team, I think obviously, you know, depending on how bad the records were, but if you think it's anything questionable, then I would, you're on the side of caution so i don't blame them if that is the reason they backed out i think that that could be the right move yep so look so then the the uh the wizards and the celtics immediately turned around and they ended up drawing in memphis into the deal so the final deal chance uh looking at it i mean well nothing has been finalized yet but this is the deal at place that looks like it's it's uh going through um is porzingis going to uh leaving washington and going to boston um, and then Marcus Smart getting traded out, going to the Memphis Grizzlies, um, and then the Washington Wizards getting Tyus Jones, um, and then also who else was, they got it? The, was it? They got the thirty fifth pick. They got Gallinari um, from Boston. I know those are yep. the two main and, parts. And Mike Muscala, I believe, mm-hmm. um, uh, throwing them in there for money reasons um, uh, to make that deal match. But then the, the surprising thing chance out of this whole deal was that the Celtics still ended up getting two draft picks out of this. Yeah, I think, I think it's a win, win, win for all sides involved. I think, um, starting with Boston who, you know, was leading the charge. They wanted a big man that could score. They obviously, you know, they've had their core of Marcus Smart, Brown and Tatum, and, you know, they've gotten so close, but ultimately it was kind of time to have some sort of breakup. We've kind of heard some rumblings about Marcus Smart over the past couple of months now. And I think it was time for a fresh start for them. Um, Przingis, if he is healthy, you know, we've talked about guys having to be available. If he's healthy, he's a great compliment to what they already have. Um, with his ability to score, he had one of his best seasons last year um, and a yep. little underrated because he's playing in you know Washington and no one was really paying attention. But he mm. if he's healthy, he's a great asset for them. I think Marcus Smart, as good as he is on defense and the value that he brings, I think he is worth you know, a couple first round picks. They also gave up 35, which is a borderline first round pick. So um, overall, I thought it was pretty fair value. I like it for Boston side. Um, I like it for Washington. They're just getting off the salary and um, they get Tyus Jones in. It looks like they're shopping Monte Morris around now. Uh, he was their starter this year, but he's seen as more of you know a long-term backup option. So I think giving Tyus the reins, let him run a team, um, happy for him. I think he's deserved a, a starting spot with how he's played. And then for the Grizzlies, I think it's an absolute win too. Obviously, they did have to give up a lot. Tyus plus two first round picks, but I do think Smart is worth it. He's a former defensive player of the year, and he essentially brings – everything you got from Dylan Brooks on defense, but better decision-making on offense. So he's a guy that even though he is smaller, he's six, three, he can guard essentially one through four, maybe even one through five. We've seen him guard, you know, guys like Przingis in the past and had success. So I think he's a guy that can be the perfect, you know, mix of two things. You needed another ball handler, especially with Jai out for 25 games. So you've got that and you needed a guy that can lock down opposing team's best wings. And even though Smart is a little undersized, he can do that as well. So he checks two boxes. He can start alongside Bain and Kennard until Jai gets back. And then they can decide, do they want to start Jai and Smart and Bain together and go small? I think that is an option because Smart can guard bigger guys. So Mm -hmm. I think it's a home run for the Grizzlies. It is a risk because you're giving up some draft capital, but these are most likely picks that'll be in the 20s tonight. It's 25. And then that Warriors pick next year will likely be a late pick. So it's not a ton given up. And, you know, Tyus, we've heard about that. He posted the Instagram story yesterday with himself in the jersey and the heart. We kind of saw the writing on the wall. I think it's best for all parties to give him a chance to do more. So I love it. I love it for Memphis, but also love it for Boston and Washington as well. Yeah, I think it's a win-win-win on all, all across the board as well. The only thing I would have liked to see, um, I think the Wizards should have pushed back a little bit on this deal as far as – uh, maybe not both of those picks going to Boston from Memphis. That maybe, maybe one of those of picks, them. yeah, coming coming to Washington. Just because the best player in the deal ended up going uh, from Washington, they should have got more draft compensation out of the deal. However, I mean, at this point, I think you're nitpicking. Um, but especially for Washington, draft picks are super valuable for them and a team that's going to be rebuilding. The other two teams mm-hmm. are contenders. Um, they're in situations where. Um, those picks aren't necessarily uh, as valuable. So I do expect the Celtics to flip those two 
picks that they probably just got from the Grizz, and maybe they they reconvene back with Washington again and reach out for someone like a Chris Paul, um, someone that they can get uh, to be a, a solid, consistent starting level point guard for them because that is something that they need, especially with the loss of Marcus Smart. Um, now, um, uh, from the Celtics uh, standpoint, overall great trade. Now, when you look at the Celtics front court between Porzingis, Al Horford, and Robert Williams, I mean, that's probably arguably, if not the best, is one of the best front courts in the league um, as far as like a rotational standpoint. Uh, Porzingis gives them an extra scoring punch, uh, scoring from the perimeter. um, And then also Porzingis. Uh, at his best is still an elite shot blocker at the rim. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love that for them. So now um, it gives Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown another another player they can pass the ball to um, that can – not the best at creating offense for himself, but he can create offense for himself uh, in, in certain spots. Um, so I think that for the Grizzlies standpoint, same thing you said, Chance. I think Marcus Smart is a great addition for this team. Also from a leadership standpoint Marcus Mm -hmm. Smart is exactly what the Grizzlies need you look at the Grizz yeah they gave up two draft picks but the Grizz have a load of draft capital and they've got a low and they've got a uh if you look at their roster it's filled with a whole bunch of young players the issue with the Grizzlies is no is is not needing younger talent it is getting experienced uh veterans on this team so at this point yeah you know uh what did uh lebron say f them picks yeah it's <laughs> f them picks for the grizz right now man at this point the grizz have enough young talent where they you know if uh if i'm zach climbing in that front office every last pick i have i'm okay with letting it go because now i've got I've got a, a core of Jaron Jackson, Desmond Bain, and John Morant, who are all still not even in their primes yet um, uh, going into the future. So uh, uh, for the Grizz standpoint, getting rid of two picks to go out and get a vet is a uh, is a great move. And they still have more picks to play with in there. Yeah, they do. They repertoire. essentially have all of their picks except this year's now. So they've still got next year and then everything up till 2029. So I was thinking about this earlier, like, it seems like the Grizz might be done. You know, that was their big all in move, but I wouldn't count out them taking mm-hmm. more future picks and still making another run at like an NOG or someone like that. And just imagine a lineup of Marcus Smart, OG, and Jaron Jackson starting together. Like teams Man. would not be able to score Clamps. on that type of team. So they're, they might still have one more move up their sleeve because, you know, mm-hmm. Smart can defend wings, but they still need kind of a true guy that can play the three slash four. So I wouldn't be surprised if they have another move that could just be, you know, using the mid-level exception on a guy on a role player. But like you said, they still have a lot of draft capital. This might not be the last move. They could try to make another home run swing. I mean, no one, no one saw this coming last night. So who knows what Kleiman's up to next? Yeah. So look, Chance, let's go around the league and talk about some other uh, things of note. So Chance, I don't know if you saw it, but Chris Middleton did opt out of that $40 million uh, uh, extension. Uh, 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 so how do you feel about Chris Middleton's chances of staying with the Bucks, or do you think he's actually going to be looking around, uh, for a, to a potential new team? I, I mean, I think he could be looking around, but ultimately I think that's just to raise his, his market value. I do think he'll be back in Milwaukee. This is just a situation of wanting more long-term money. He's, you know, over the age of 30, he's had some injury concerns. If I'm him, I'm thinking, let me get one more large contract. Obviously it sounds crazy for someone like you or me to say we would decline $40 million for a season, but <laughs> ultimately he could get, you know, a lot more than that over three to four years. And he wants that, you know, long-term security for his one last large contract. And I do expect Milwaukee to give that to him. So I don't yeah. see him going anywhere. But I mean, you never know if they decide they want to move on and try to get a little younger on the wings. It could be a sign and trade situation where they send him somewhere else that needs some veteran help. But ultimately, I would definitely bet on him signing back to Milwaukee for a longer term, maybe three or four year deal. Yeah, he might take less money on the on the uh, from the year standpoint, but right. getting a longer deal is going to be especially someone with him who's who struggled with injuries of late. Um, and so securing that long term bag is super important. Chance oh, yeah. also. The Lakers have the number 17th and 47 picks. They've been linked to Indiana. They were linked to Indiana all last year um, about Miles Turner and Buddy Hill. Um, uh, I don't necessarily know what that looks like, um, but uh, that is something that is on the radar. So, I mean, it's showing that the Lakers are trying to be opportunistic with re-signing their players and then actually um, uh, making moves to – 
to stay in this whole win now uh, window. Looks like uh, looks like they've kind of diverted away from whale hunting. We're trying mm-hmm. to go after the Kyrie's and and going after uh, uh, the Russell Westbrook's. Like they kind of gotten away from that, and it looks like they're trying to take a different approach with, of team building, which is good, right? Oh yeah, definitely good. I think um, obviously they were so close last year. I think every move that Polinka made towards the deadline was a, a net positive. So I I think they're you know one or two moves moves away and Indiana would be a great trade partner. Indiana seems to be very active around this time too. They've got the seventh pick. There was rumors that they were in talks with Atlanta for a DeAndre Hunter uh, situated deal, but they didn't want to, you know, make the the trade pick swap there. They've been rumored with Jonathan Kaminga. So it looks like Indiana is trying to find another wing. That could be an Austin Reeves situation, some type of sign and trade. If I'm LA, I'm not letting Austin Reeves out of my sight, but that could be an option on the table. So I expect both of these teams to continue to be active and um, throughout the night and see what kind of moves they make for sure. Right. And then chances, uh, it's a lot of wings being talked about. Toronto, uh, Pascal Siakam, o- and OG uh, Ananobi are being thrown out there. But one of the uh, uh, latest surprises were – the Clippers are potentially looking to move Paul George. Paul George's name has came up specifically uh, in a conversation with the New York Knicks. Um, do you think there's a chance that Paul George is out of uh, L.A.? I don't think so. I've read some you know, more reports. Jake Fisher had a, an article this morning where he said he doesn't think they're ultimately going to shop Paul George, that they're committed to building a team around these two. Ultimately, if I'm them, you went all in on this duo of Kawhi and Paul George. You had the one bubble season where they were healthy and they you know, were a couple breaks away from a finals run. And since then, they just haven't been able to stay on the court. At this point, you've got your new stadium coming in in a year or so. I think they're committed to winning. I would anticipate them trying at least for another year to build around these two. So I wouldn't anticipate it, but once you put that name out there, you never know who's going to come knocking on the door with a ludicrous offer. And if that's the case, you know, how do you say no? So I could, I think there's a possibility, but if it were, if it were me betting on this, I would think Paul George ends up back in LA and they make some other surrounding moves to try to build around these two um, is what I'm thinking. Yeah. And then we still don't know what Portland's going to do. I think after things shake out with the second pick chance, it looks Mm -hmm. like the Portland has shut down all the Damian Lillard rumors about trading him. Uh, But uh, there has been a rumor out there sprinkled around, uh, not getting much truth on it yet, about Cat going to Portland for the third pick. Um, So um, it looks like they're trying to make moves. The Nets are going to try to be extremely active because, I mean, they're in a window where they don't really have any of their own picks. Yep. So um, uh, it looks like they're trying to either get more picks, uh, but also stay competitive. You hear names like Dorian Finney-Smith out there on the market, uh, Royce O'Neal um, mm-hmm. out there as well being uh, dangled uh, for the Nets to move up. The Nets currently have the 21st and the 22nd pick, um, so I expect them to be an active team as well, Chance. Um, are there any other teams that you're that are on your radar going into the draft tonight? Yeah, um, the ones you mentioned, really, I think the draft starts with Portland, especially if it seems like Charlotte is committed to scoot at two. I think deciding what they do at three, do they go with the, you know, Brandon Miller's the obvious third, you know, best prospect, arguably second best prospect. So do they draft him or do they move back? As you mentioned, Kat's been in the rumors. Zion has even been in in the rumors. And so New Orleans is another team that I'm keeping my eye on with the Zion talks. Do they make that big splash and go all in for a top five pick and some additional capital? Atlanta is another team that seems like they're very active. They've got a lot of guys that you've heard at some point or another at trade talks from mm-hmm. Collins, who's been on the on the trade block for like four years now. Um, DeJounte Murray, I've even seen that they're open to trying to split that that duo up even after a season. So Atlanta is definitely a team that I'm interested in seeing what they do along with New Orleans. But there could also be some surprise teams that come out of nowhere as well. Does San Antonio decide they want to try to get a couple vets and just go all in for a win now with Wimbenyama because he could be that good in his rookie season? Um, that's one. Golden State, I could see being active as well. I've heard Kaminga in some rumors. Um, so they could be you know, trying to maximize their their possible last year or two with their core. Um, obviously, we've got the Draymond situation looming on what's going to happen there. And then Houston is another one. They've got a top yep. five pick, but they're also rumored to be shopping around at 20. Do they decide that they want to try to build around potentially James Harden coming in and some other vets? Or do they just keep maximizing youth? So honestly, man, like there's not many teams that are quiet at this point. It seems like no. with yeah, the way the league is talking. shaping up and the parity, even Denver who just won a title, they're trading picks mm-hmm. left and right and trying to maximize their – their long-term success. So I think it's going to be a really fun night. I can't wait for it to start and just to keep refreshing Twitter and see the fireworks that come along. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited. And then also I think uh, I'm, I'm expecting Dallas to make a move tonight as well. There's um, no way they're because, keeping that 10th pick, right? Yeah. 
because it doesn't make sense to stay at 10. Honestly, it makes more sense to trade down, get another asset, um, uh, or trade that 10 pick for someone that can win now. Uh, I just – I don't really – unless somebody falls to them that makes sense for them um, uh, uh, from that standpoint. Like I saw some reports like Cam Whitmore might might uh, might fall in the draft. I could see Dallas maybe saying, oh, maybe we could use some extra shooting. Um, uh, you know, Taylor Hendricks, a guy that – that uh that is just a do it all Swiss Army knife, um somebody like that that'll be that could benefit from playing next to a guy like Luka Doncic who's mm-hmm. just gonna, who's going to throw the ball at the rim and you go right. get it. Um, yep. unless unless some guys like that are at, on the board, Anthony Black, um a, a a guy who's a who can be a good three and D defender, um at the guard position and a little bit of the wing, um that's six seven and versatile. If a can guy like the ball that, a little bit too. Yeah, handle the ball a little bit. If a guy like that falls, um, I could see Dallas uh, maybe staying there and holding Pat um, and then maybe potentially trying to uh, to offload uh, like a Tim Hardaway or a, a Davis Bertans uh, a contract, which is going to be is nearly an expiring deal uh, mm-hmm. for maybe another asset or something like that. So, I mean, but, but man, it's a lot of possibilities. And, man, this is – Chance, this is shaping up to be one of – the most eventful draft nights that we've seen in a while. Oh yeah. I think with as much parity that is in the league and we saw that in the playoffs, we saw, you know, two play in teams making deep runs in Miami and, and LA and the deadline last year, I remember having this discussion where like, you know, is, is it going to live up to the hype or is it going to be a dud? And there ended up being just deals left and right everywhere. And it was crazy. And so I kind of get the same feeling on draft night. You know, it sounds like it's hyped up to be a night where there could be a lot of moves. We've already seen that the last couple of days with the Bradley Beal trade and the Przingis and Smart trade. I don't think we're done here. I think it's going to be another very active night and looking forward to reconnecting soon to get our, our instant reactions. Yes, sir. Well, look, guys, until later on tonight, because today is going to be a double day. We're working extra hard for you guys to keep you guys up to date so you guys can thank us for that. All right. But anyways, (laughs) until next time, y'all, we will holla at you. Peace.